With that, I'm pleased to introduce our presenter for this series, Max Krug. Max is with Future State Engineering and has over 29 years of experience in operations, including 16 years consulting with companies in a variety of sectors on a variety of topics. He's our go-to guru when it comes to things operational excellence, so we're happy to have him with us today and for this series to help companies in this area. With that, I will go ahead and turn it over to you, Max. Thanks, Molly. So welcome everyone to the first session today. Our session today, like Molly said, is a foundations to operational excellence. So we're gonna talk about what are the necessary and sufficient conditions to create a high performing organization. So we'll get into it right away. So first thing we're gonna do is talk about what is operational excellence. So how do we define operational excellence? If you go on Google and you Google operational excellence, you're gonna find a hundred different definitions. So I want to talk about what are the key elements of operational excellence and not really define exactly what it is. It's specifically you define it for your company and what you're trying to achieve, but it starts with the customer. And so we look at the customers and our customers have certain needs. And what we see is that different customers have different needs, different markets have different needs. If you're serving different markets or different customers, you'll see that they have different needs. We need to take those needs and those are the inputs to our organization. And our goal is to provide some level of customer satisfaction, hopefully more than what our competitors are providing to our customers or what our customers can get from a substitutable, substitutable product or service. If we look within the organization, I see it doesn't matter what type of organization you are, that there's three functions that are necessary in the organization. So the three functions are finance, operations, and sales and marketing. There's other functions in the organization, which we call supporting functions, but these are core functions. So supporting functions would be like HR or quality control or maintenance, but the core functions are finance operations and marketing and sales. And they each have areas of responsibility, but they also have areas of overlapping responsibility. And where I see most companies struggling is the interface between functions. So typically organizations operate well within their functions, but it's between functions where we start to see we have problems and conflicts. And leadership's role is to ensure that these three functions are working in conjunction with one another and they're aligned and we're all marching towards the same objective and goals. So to me, operational excellence is about leadership. It's about alignment of the organization. It's about defining where we're going as an organization and how we're gonna get there and a heavy emphasis on satisfying the needs of the customer. So what are the necessary and sufficient conditions to create a high performing organization? And when we look at the terms necessary and sufficient, what is necessary? It's something that needs to be in place to achieve some objective. In organizations, I see sometimes they're, they don't have the necessary elements in place to create a high performing organization. So in that case, you gotta put the necessary elements in. And then I also see that they do, might have the necessary things in place, but they're not sufficient. And what does that mean? It means that the process doesn't deliver the results we're looking for. So for operational excellence, we need the necessary elements to achieve the goals, and then they need to be sufficient where they're giving the correct results to um, achieve those goals. So what are the necessary conditions? So I have this picture here. And if you look at this picture and you had to describe this picture with one word, what one word would you use to describe this picture? And usually when I ask this question, many people can answer that, it's focus. So operational excellence is all about focus. And when we look at focus, we need to define that. From my experience, we define focus as what should be done. 
So in order to achieve our objectives, we must define what should be done. But we found that that's not sufficient to achieve operational excellence. So we have a second element, not doing what shouldn't be done. So it's not difficult to identify what should be done. It's extremely difficult to stop doing what shouldn't be done. And so the necessary conditions we need to achieve operational excellence, we have four of them. First of all, satisfy all the customer's needs. Not part of the customer's needs, part of the time, not um, some of the customers all the time, it's all the customers all the time. Second is we need to need, meet the needs of the organization. So the st stakeholders have needs and we need to make sure that we meet those needs. And who are the stakeholders? Of course, it's the ownership, it's the employees, it's the customers, it's the suppliers, it could be the community. So there's a lot of stakeholders in your organization. We need to understand what are their needs and make sure we satisfy all those needs. Next is establish the mindset to achieve sustainable improvement. What I found is if you don't have the proper mindset, you're not gonna be able to make the necessary changes to achieve operational excellence and more importantly, sustain those. And we're talking about sustainability here. So I'm not looking to put some temporary solution in place and then three months we're slipped back and doing old habits again. It needs to be sustainable over the long term. And lastly, is a positive change in organizational culture. What is culture? I define it as how organizations make decisions. It's how people treat each other. It's how work gets done. And the culture defines how well the organization works together as a team. I go into a lot of organizations and the first thing I hear is when I talk about operational excellence is, oh, you don't understand, we're different. So most problems I see in companies are relatively the same, but what is different is the culture. So every organization has a different culture and the operational excellence program or implementation needs to be designed to fit your culture. And so there's different techniques that we use on how we address different things and how we um, go and implement solutions to problems, and that's a function of the, the environment and the culture. When we look at organizational alignment, we can look at effectiveness and efficiency. I'm all about effectiveness. I'm not so much about efficiency. So what is effectiveness? Our goal is to achieve a high-performing organization. And if I use a boat rowing team, I can describe what's the difference between effectiveness and efficiency. So we have two rowing teams here. The team at the top is effective because they're all rowing together in sync to get to the finish line in the most effective manner, which is a straight line. So everyone's rowing in sync to meet the goal of achieving the finish line in the fastest possible time. The second rowing team at the bottom here, we have one rower that's three times more efficient than everybody else. And so by him being three times more efficient, the boat goes off course. A lot of times I see measures in companies about driving efficiency everywhere. If we're driving efficiency everywhere, we're gonna not meet our goal, we're gonna go off course. So a lot of the undesirable effects I see in companies are because we're trying to drive efficiency everywhere. The goal isn't to be efficient everywhere. The goal is to be effective as an organization where everybody's working together to achieve the common goal. And so sometimes we need to stop doing some things in order for the system to be effective. So what is operational excellence? It's a philosophy of leadership that stresses three things, teamwork, problem solving, and continuous improvement. So if we talk about the first element, teamwork, what is teamwork? Teamwork is everybody working together and leveraging the knowledge, experience, education of the people on the team to 
get better results than what we can do individually. If we think of the word teamwork, a lot of times we think of sports teams. So when we think of a team, so we just, you know, had the football playoffs this past weekend and the football team, I don't really like the design of a football team because after every activity, they get back together and say, okay, that didn't work. What's our next plan? So after each activity, they're getting back together and decide what's the next step. To me, that's not a good example of a team. A good example of a team is I like to use the NASCAR pit crew. So in a NASCAR pit crew, everybody knows their responsibility. Everybody knows how their actions affect other people on the team. And they work together to make sure that they do the changeover in the fastest possible time. So in some cases, some people need to be less efficient for that process to be efficient. And if you follow NASCAR or you go on Google and watch a NASCAR changeover, what you'll see is that the changeover is determined by the rate at which the tire changers can change the tires. So everybody subordinates to the tire changer. What does that mean? If you watch the race and you watch the pit crew, the tire changer goes to the right side of the car. And when he comes running around to the left side of the car, actually the guy that's putting the fuel in the car steps out of the way and lets that tire changer run in front of him. So the goal isn't to have the fuel done as fast as possible. The goal is to make the changeover as fast as possible. So everyone subordinates to the tire changer to make him most efficient. So teamwork is about understanding what's the most effective way to accomplish what we're trying to accomplish as a team, not making each task efficient. Second is problem solving. If I had to classify what I see as what companies are worst at, it's problem solving. They don't know how to go through and systematically solve problems and put permanent countermeasures in place. A lot of companies are good at putting Band-Aid solutions in place, but they're not good at putting permanent countermeasures in place. In problem solving, we need to, the first step is understand the situation and then def properly define the problem. A lot of times I see solutions going in place and I ask, so what problem is that solving? And people look at me like, that's a good question. I was just in a company, they're like, oh, we need an ERP system. We need a new ERP system. I'm like, okay, what problem is that going to solve for you? They're like, that's a good question. And so we got to step back before we put in a solution and understand what problem are we trying to solve? And then what's the best approach to solve that problem? And then lastly is continuous improvement. So we have a saying that every improvement is change, but not every change is an improvement. So what does that mean? Yes, we can take a process and every process can be improved significantly. And I'm talking not two, three, four percent. I improve processes 50 percent, 80 percent, 200 improve 200 percent improvement in process performance. But if that doesn't translate into improved company performance, like reducing lead time, improving quality for the customer, improving on-time delivery, improving the profitability. If it doesn't translate into one of those key performance indicator metrics, it's not an improvement. Yes, it's an improvement at the process level, but we need to look at it from the company level. I see a lot of activities going on in companies where they're making changes that they think are improvements. But when we, I ask, okay, how's this affecting our key performance metrics, and most of the initiatives have no impact on the key performance metrics, then why are we doing them? So remember I said earlier, stop doing things that don't translate into improved company performance. That's our focus. Do what should be done and don't do what shouldn't be done. So from a continuous improvement perspective, what are the key things that we need to do to improve the business performance? And actually it's simpler than you think, but we get in this mindset of like, we got to make process changes everywhere and improvements everywhere. And we spend all this effort 
and no results. I see it in lean. It's like, oh, let's do 5S everywhere. So we do a big 5S initiative across the whole plant. And is that improving our company performance? In most cases, no. So why are we spending all this time organizing when it's not translating into improved company performance? So how do we achieve operational excellence? There's three elements, focus on the needs of the customer, empower employees, and focus management attention. So we already talked about the customer focus. Second is empowering employees. So I believe the most valuable asset in any company is the employees. And when we get a team together that has the right focus, it's amazing what can be accomplished. We have tons of experience in the company and we need to leverage that experience. I went into one company and they do um, refining of oil and they're like, well, what's your experience in oil refining? I said, zero. You don't need another expert in oil refining. You need an expert in how to manage teams and how to understand what initiatives are going to translate into increased business performance. They have PhDs on the staff in oil refining. They don't need more expertise than that. You need expertise in problem solving skills. You need expertise in how to think from a system perspective. That's what I bring to the table. Then lastly is focus management attention. So working on the things that should be done and not working on the things that shouldn't be done. And again, defining what are those critical things that need to be done and what are the things that are not critical. I'll give you another example. A lot of times when I see um, problem solving and we have a problem, they're like, oh, we need to have a re resolution in place in 48 hours. So we're inundated with problems. And then what happens is we document the problems and then we pencil whip it and nothing ever changes. And what I teach companies is all problems aren't created equal. So if you treat all problems as equal, you're just gonna spin your wheels and never solve any problems. But if you understand which problems are critical to the business and which ones aren't, there's actually very few problems that are critical to the business. If we can focus on those and knock them out of the park, we get substantial increase in performance for the company. So th this is our first section of the presentation. Let's do a quick review. Operational excellence is defined by the customer. So depending on what market you're in, you're gonna have different customer needs. That's um, defined by the value. And there's two different types of need, what we call explicit and implicit needs. Explicit needs are things that the customer tells us they need. Implicit needs are the things that they complain about that you and your competitors are making for your customers. So the relentless pursuit of delivering cost to customers expectation each and every time. So it's not just the end of the month. If you have an end of the month syndrome where we have a big rush of getting orders out at the end of the month and we don't work on what's needed by the customer, we work on what's gonna give us the most revenue for the month and then we have misalignment. Second, we need to establish the necessary and sufficient conditions to deliver the expectations in the most effective manner, which means leadership is committed and aligned. So we all agree what needs to be done and the sequence that it needs to be done. We empower the employees into teams to leverage their knowledge, experience, and education. We establish the correct culture and mindset to achieve operational excellence and focus, focus, focus. I can't stress that enough about how much you need to focus, which means doing what should be done to achieve the goal and doing what not doing, not doing what shouldn't be done. And if I step back, first of all, does everyone understand what is the goal of the organization? If there's not a clearly defined goal, that's the first step we need to do is to find where are we going as an organization and then start aligning all activities to that goal. Okay, so that's our first section. I think Molly has a poll that she's going to launch. 
So if you could kindly answer the poll. So the poll is, does your organization have a vision and mission statement that is communicated to the workforce? And we're just looking for a yes or no answer here. And when I say communicate to the workforce, if I go ask any employee what's the vision and mission statement, they can give me a rough idea of what that is. And I'm amazed how many times I get blank stares. Okay, so this is good that companies on the call, 73% say that they have a mission statement that's communicated and 27% no. Okay, now we're gonna move on to the next section about organizational culture. Understanding your culture and motivating employees to achieve breakthrough results. And we talk about breakthrough results, we're talking greater than 25% performance improvement. So in this section of the necessary conditions, we're gonna focus on establishing the positive change in organizational culture. So we're big Dilbert fans at Future State Engineering. So there's a couple of cartoons here about culture. So the boss says, we're hiring a director of change management to help employees embrace strategic changes. And Dilbert says, or we could come up with some strategies that make sense that employees would embrace change. And the boss says, that sounds harder. And our second one, the guy says, we need to focus a culture of innovation. Does anyone have an idea what how we can do that. And Dilbert says, yes, you could give us less work. You could stop criticizing every idea that we have. And he says, does anyone have a suggestion that is it ridiculous? Okay, so what is culture? So it's the values and behaviors that create a unique social and psychological environment within the organization. It represents the collective values, beliefs, principles of members of the organization. So what are the influence, how people interact with each other, how decisions are made, how people treat each other, how knowledge is created, how change is viewed by employees, and how employees share, or a lot of times don't share knowledge. And again, every organization I go into is different how this happens within organizations. So high performing organizations have a culture where it's not about me, it's about improving the organization performance, they share knowledge, they make decisions um, that are aligned with what the goals of the organization are, they treat people with respect. When new knowledge is created, people share that knowledge. Sometimes I see in organizations where people think that knowledge is job security, so they don't share knowledge that they have. And there's a lot of what I call tribal knowledge in the company that only a few people know. and they don't share that with other people in the organization. And then when that person's out, the process stops because it's like, oh, only Joe knows how to do that. So when Joe's not here, uh, we don't know what to do. So we wait for Joe to come back to perform that process. So what are symptoms of some cultural issues? When I go into companies, I interview people and I get different, what we call, undesirable effects. And these are samples of undesirable effects that I typically hear in companies. So first of all, when we do improvements, they're not sustained. So we do some improvement and then months later it slips back. Or employees are frustrated with the lack of accountability. So nobody's accountable for anything. Employees feel that communication is poor. Employee morale is declining. Employees are frustrated with improvement efforts. Managers feel pressure to micromanage. Resources are constantly under pressure to deal with new priorities. Employees don't feel appreciated in their efforts. Resources are spread too thin. There's lack of buy-in to plan changes. Problems take too long to resolve. There's no, timely, there's no time to provide timely feedback to employees. So if you have any of these undesirable effects, it's symptoms of deeper cultural issues. So how do we address those? So I like to use this change management matrix. So what's a change management matrix? So it's four boxes that make up 
um, elements around change, and there's two axes. So we have our axis here on the left and our axis across the top. And so there's four boxes because there's negatives of not changing. So this box down here in the lower left, there's positives of not changing, there's positives of change, and there's negatives of change. And so when we start the change process, we start with the negatives of not changing. These are the alligators or the complaints that we hear from the employees. So these are easier to find. Just talk to employees and ask them about their frustrations. And you'll go get a whole list of frustrations. And that previous slide was frustrations I heard from people when I interview them. So we start with the negatives of not changing. These are all the alligators that are biting us every day. Then what we want to define is what's our pot of gold? What's the positive of change? If we could make things better, what does good look like for the organization? So we define that. So that's our objective. Then we have the positives of not changing, which is our mermaid. So we wanna make sure that we keep doing the things that we do well. Don't stop doing those. And then lastly is our negatives of change. And these are the negative consequences of change. So these are the partial solutions. And when you, if you've ever been in a meeting and you suggested an idea and you get five people say, oh, that'll never work because, and they'll give you five reasons why it won't work. Those are the negatives of change. So to be a complete solution, the solution needs to eliminate the alligators, achieve the pot of gold, minimize the crutches, and maintain the mermaids. And so there's a technique how to take a team and progress them through this change matrix. If you're not trained on how to facilitate that, it can become a disaster, especially in a team setting. So in a team setting, when you present an idea, you're gonna have people in all four of these boxes. You're gonna have people that are just gonna complain about the way things are happening now. You'll see people that understand the pot of gold of what you're trying to accomplish. You'll have people say, I don't understand why we're even talking about this because things are working fine. And then you'll have the yes buts of like, yeah, but if we do that, there's 10 reasons why it's not gonna work. So if you're not facilitated, if you're not trained in how to facilitate teams through this process, you'll just get frustrated and walk out of the meeting and be like, man, these people don't understand. So to be a complete solution, again, we need to make sure we address all the alligators and we address all the negatives of the potential change. If we can do that, then it becomes a complete solution. So what we don't want is we put in a solution and it causes negative implications and other functions. And I see it happen all the time. <clears throat> so when we look at our issues, we have employees that are frustrated. We have the frustrated with the improvement efforts, morale is declining, improvements are not sustained. Those are all the negatives, but we wanna be a high performing organization. So if we, do all these changes, one negative consequence would be, well, what happens if employers, we do all this training for our employees, we become a high performing organization and other employers in the area steal our employees, right? That's a negative implication of becoming a high performing organization. What we currently do is we invest in ongoing training for our employees. So we wanna continue doing that. We have a comprehensive onboarding process. So that's something that we do well. And what we wanna do is make sure that we put the proper things in place to prevent this issue of employers stealing our employees. If we can do that, eliminate the negatives, keep doing the positives, eliminate the negatives of change, then we can become a high performing organization. So building a high performing organization is a four step process. The first step is understand what to change. And we call that the managerial know-how. So does management understand what's necessary to achieve high performance? The second step, once we agree on what to change, 
and, and that's really addressing the cause of the alligator. So not the symptoms. So the complaints you hear are the symptoms. You need to understand what's the cause. The second step is to define what to change to. So there's multiple ways that the alligators can be eliminated. The question is what's the best for your organization? And that's the operational know-how. What should we be doing to eliminate the alligators? So define how to achieve the pot of gold. Third step is how to cause the change. So that's having the right mindset. We call it the psychological know-how. How do we take people through the buy-in process to get everybody on board and aligned? And we have a process we call the design sprint that is designed exactly to do that is to create the psychological know-how. So we need to eliminate the alligators. Then the fourth step is how to sustain the change. We call that the behavioral know-how. So to sustain it, you've got to change the employee behavior. If you don't change the behavior, you're going to slip back to old practices within months. That's minimizing or eliminating the crutches and keeping more of the mermaids. Okay, so this is our second section. So let's do a quick review on culture. So culture is the unique values and behaviors within the organization. It's how people interact, make decisions, and treat each other. It's how employees do changes within the organization. Establishing a high-performing culture, we need leadership commitment and alignment. We need to empower employees to achieve buy-in. We need to establish the correct mindset. And again, focus, focus, focus. Do what should be done to achieve the goal. Don't do what shouldn't be done. Okay, so I think Molly's gonna launch the next poll. So our second poll, can your employees name the top two or three priorities of your organization? Okay, so most people, which is good, the employees can name the top two or three priorities. And I read an uh, article in Harvard Business Review that talked about this. So the CEO met with top managers every month and she talked about the top five priorities of the organization every month. They went in and interviewed the managers within that company and asked if they could name the top five priority only 55% could name one priority. So maybe you believe that your people understand the top priorities, but go ask them and see what answers you get. I think you'll be surprised. Okay. We're moving on to the third section and the last section for this session today. It's achieving organizational alignment through customer focus and understanding the customer. And I'm amazed how many companies don't understand the needs of their customer. And it can be twofold. Not everybody in the organization has the external customers, their customers. Some people have internal customers. And I'm amazed how many people don't understand who their internal customers are. If you don't understand who your internal customers are, how are you providing them what, with what they need to do their job? So in this section, we're gonna talk about the necessary condition of satisfying all the customer's needs. And again, our Dilbert cartoon, what is not customer focus? The guy says, our goal is to ship a million units this quarter. And Dilbert says, do we have any goals that involve making our customers happy? He says, I'm talking about our goals, not their goals. The boss says, yeah, totally different. So I see a lot of companies that are so internal focused, they forget about the external customer. So what is customer focus? It's understanding the needs better than your customers understand their own needs or understanding the needs that they don't understand that they actually have. So Henry Ford said, if I asked people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. 
what I find is a lot of companies are in the mindset of like, well, this is how it is because that's the way we've always done it. And if you ask them to determine better ways of doing it, they get caught with that mindset of like, well, this is how it's done. We can't think of any other way to do it. So to get out of that mindset, we got to break the paradigm or we got to look at it from a different perspective. So Henry Ford said, hey, we don't need horses, right? So nobody asked a question about, do we actually need the horse? He came up with a solution to eliminate the horse. So it's de delivering something that the customer didn't think was possible that'll differentiate you from your competitors. And I have a few companies up here you might have heard of. And just to show that a competitive advantage doesn't discriminate, we have a service company, a logistics company, a distribution company, and a manufacturing company. So how do they differentiate themselves from other of their competitors? And so we'll talk about value. So how they differentiate themselves is by creating value. What is value? So I like the definition that Dr. Goldratt developed, that developed the theory of constraints. I was actually trained by Dr. Goldratt. He said value is creating by removing a significant limitation for the customer in a way that was not possible before to the extent that no significant competitor can deliver. So if you think about these four companies, Google, FedEx, Omron, if you don't know who Omron is, they developed the first handheld blood pressure monitoring device and Amazon. What limitation did they remove for the customer? So if we talk about Google, what, what limitation did they remove? I don't need to go to the library or to a periodical to get information. So they eliminated the need to go someplace physically to access information. We can access information anywhere in the world with our smartphones. Okay, FedEx, prior to FedEx, the limitation was I couldn't ship packages across the world in days. It took weeks to get packages shipped across the world. They said, okay, you don't have to wait weeks anymore to ship a package, you can get it next day. So FedEx removed that limitation. Omron, the handheld blood pressuring monitoring device, I don't need to go to a doctor to get my blood pressure taken. And then Amazon, if you shop Amazon, what limitation do they remove? I don't need to go to the store, realize that two out of the 10 items I'm looking for are out of stock and then go to another store and then stand in line to check out and that whole process. So they limited the need to go physically to a store to get things that you need. And I can shop 24 seven and compare prices and a check of availability right online. Okay, so what common denominator do these four companies have? So if we look at the limitation they removed, the common denominator is they're saving time for their customer. So I'm gonna ask everyone on the call, how are you wasting your customer's time? If you're wasting your customer's time somehow, there's huge opportunity to bring value for them. So these four companies prove that time is the most valuable commodity in the world because they're huge companies. So let's talk about value and price. So what is value and what is price? So value is only meaningful when it's expressed in terms of specific product or service, which meets the customer need at a specific time. So a lot of people have a problem with this. It's like, oh, this is our price. And no matter what the situation is, it's the same price. But you need to understand it from a value perspective. So I'll give you an example. Let's just say you're on your way to an important meeting. And in this meeting, you have a chance of landing a $5 million deal for your company. On the way to the meeting, you get a flat tire. So what are you willing to pay to have that flat tire fixed? Likewise, you wake up on a Saturday morning, nothing really important to do. You go out and look at your car, it's got a flat tire. What are you willing to pay to get that flat tire fixed in that situation? Same problem, 
different situation. You're going to pay much more to fix that flat tire to get to that meeting on time than you are the flat tire in your driveway when you have nothing important to get to. So it has nothing to do with the activity. It has everything to do with how much value it brings for you as a person. So the degree at which the organization meets the customer needs defines value that the organization provides. And most companies don't even understand the needs of their customer. When we look at price, price is determined by how much the customer is willing to pay based on the level of value of the product or service. And so I find it interesting when I look at companies, they spend a ton of time trying to figure out what their costs are. And so I ask them, so why are you spending all this effort to understand what your costs are? So the answer is, so we know what to charge the customer. So the perception is that the cost plus some margin is the price. The customers don't care about your cost. <laughs> they care about what value are you going to bring to them? So cost has no relevance to the value, your cost. And price has nothing to do with your cost. It has everything to do with the customer's perception of value. Okay, so that's one of the mindset changes that companies need to make. It's like, I don't care what your costs are. You can spend all the time figuring out what your costs are. Price has nothing to do with that. Yes, it's a need of the organization to make money, to make a profit. So the difference between cost and what you can sell it for is your margin, but don't use price to figure out what your cost, don't use cost to figure out what your price are. There's no relationship. And well, if we look at what are useful outputs, so what are useful outputs? If we look at a system, and here we're using supplier input process output customer, which we call the SIPOC diagram. If you have Six Sigma training, you understand what SIPOC is. But useful outputs are defined as the necessary and sufficient inputs as defined by the next step in the process. So we call that the customer. When we're designing operational excellence, we start with the external customer and say, okay, what are their needs? So their needs define what the outputs of the organization need to be. Those outputs of the organization define what the process outputs need to be. Those process outputs define what the process inputs need to be. And those inputs define what the suppliers need to deliver to the company. So we start backwards from the supply chain and work backwards to the supply chain towards our suppliers. And we define the necessary and sufficient inputs. So a lot of times I see the necessary inputs aren't there and they're not sufficient. So how do we expect to meet our customer's requirements when we don't have the necessary inputs and they're not sufficient? And a lot of times I see unnecessary inputs, which means there's things that we're doing that the customer doesn't really care about. And I see it happening all the time. So one of the first steps is eliminate those things that we're doing that aren't necessary for the customer, which is either the external customer or the next step in the process. And usually I see it in terms of daily reports. So people spend a lot of time putting daily report information together and they send it out each week or each day in an email of here's the report for the week. And I want you to try something. If you do that, stop sending the report and see how many people reach out to you and say, hey, hey, I miss that report you send out every week. Are we going to get it this week? You'll be surprised what you find. Mostly you're going to hear crickets. So what I find is most people aren't even looking at the report. So why are we doing it? Okay. So the foundation of operational excellence is the customer defines requirements for all the processes that are necessary and sufficient to meet their needs. If we look at levels of competitive advantage, I spend a lot of time trying to help companies improve their competitive advantage. And I developed this pyramid, which shows the number of competitors here at the bottom and the time for a competitor to replicate the competitive advantage. And this is based on a concept called blue ocean strategy. So if you're not familiar with blue ocean strategy, you, there's a book out there 
called Blue Ocean Australia. It talks about how to create uncontested market space. And to me, Amazon, Google, those organizations are in uncontested market space. So the blue ocean's here at the top, the red ocean's at the bottom. So what's the lowest level of competitive advantage? The lowest level of competitive advantage is price. Once you set the price, how soon before your competitors can match it or beat it? In today's world, it's minutes. So we don't wanna be competing on price. If you're competing on price, you're just competing with everyone on trying to get this business and it's a shark frenzy. The next level up is I put as quality. So this is sort of form fit and function of the product or service that you provide. So is it providing high quality for the customer? Yes, it can give you a short-term competitive advantage, but your competitors can buy new technology. They can do some things in the short term to improve quality. And so it can give you a short-term um, competitive advantage, but not sustainable for the long term. Next up on the pyramid is changing a deep rooted policy. So these are typically policies internally that prevent you from giving better service to your customers. And I see it all the time, but companies for some reason can't see it themselves. So I'm gonna give an example here. I'd like to pick on the postal service. So a lot of times, when people are working during the week, when do they go to the post office? During their lunch hour. So when you go to the post office during your lunch hour, what do you see? There's a line of 25 people and they have one counter open and everyone's waiting in line to get served. That's their peak demand period. So why do they only have one person at the counter? Because, oh, that's our lunch time, right? We gotta take lunch. So it's probably written in the union contract that they take lunch from 12 to one, but why wouldn't you have all your people at the counter during the peak demand period to service the customer? So the policy is, oh, we take lunch from 12 to one. We'll change that policy, take it in an off peak period. How much better customer service are you gonna give? And I see these policies every place in the company. So if we can change that policy, it's extremely difficult for a company to change a policy. We're looking to change multiple policies within a company. If we can change three to four policies, that's a competitive advantage. Next up on the pyramid is changing a paradigm for the customer. So what is a paradigm? It's a way of thinking or a belief. If we can change that paradigm for the customer, then it gives us another level of competitive advantage. And so the example I'm gonna use here is Walmart. So when Walmart first came on the horizon, if you were, um, if you were here before Walmart, so I call it pre-Walmart people, where, how did they change the paradigm? So pre-Walmart, if I needed to get prescription drugs, I would go to the drug store. If I needed groceries, I'd go to the grocery store. If I needed my car worked out, I took it to my mechanic. If I needed um, my you know, other services, I went to that specific person. So I had to go to all these different locations to get what I needed. Walmart said, hey, we can come in, you can get your prescription filled, do your grocery shopping, um, get your car worked on all at the same time. And because we're large, we can get better pricing. So they change the paradigm for the customer. You don't need to go 10 places to get what you need. It's a one-stop shop. You can come here and get everything that you need. So Walmart became huge by changing that paradigm for the customers. Then Amazon comes along and says, hey, you know what? You don't need to go there to do it. You can do most of that shopping from home and not even leave your house and have it delivered next day or two days. So now they remove that limitation of actually physically going someplace to get what I need. So this is the pyramid of competitive advantage. What we want to do is take your organization and move it up this pyramid, giving service to the customer that nobody else in your market can give. Then you've carved out a blue ocean for you and have uncontested market space. But if you don't understand the needs of your customer, you're never going to achieve the top of this pyramid. 
So our customer focus review, how do we get better customer? How do we get a competitive advantage, deliver something that the customer didn't think is possible? that will differentiate you from your competitors. So the foundations of operational excellence, the customer defines requirements for the process that are necessary and sufficient to meet their needs. Align all processes in the organization to service those needs. Values the degree which the organization meets the customer's needs and removing a significant limitation for the customer will provide huge value for the customer. Okay, so I think we have another poll and we'll talk about homework. So our third poll question, do you feel your organization has a competitive advantage in your market so that you can, you're differentiating your market from all your competitors? Okay, so a little bit more equal here. So about 56% say yes, 44% say no. So if you say no, then there's opportunity for your organization to get a huge competitive advantage if you really focus and understand the needs of the customer and then align everybody in the organization to satisfy those needs. Okay, so homework for next week, based on our poll questions, take a random sampling of the employees and ask them if they know the vision and mission statement for the organization. I think you'll be surprised what you hear. So all levels, so doing all levels of the organization, not just leadership, not just high level managers, every level in the organization, ask them what's the vision and mission statement. And that same group, can they name the top priorities for the organization? And I'll be interested to hear what consistent you, consistency you get in those answers. Okay, so that's our session for today. Um, you can contact me via LinkedIn. I do postings every week. Our website, futurestateengineering.com, Northwest IRC's website, nwirc.org. So that's our session for today. We can open it up for questions. If people have questions or comments, we'll take them now. Okay, we don't have any in the Q&A box, so I'll invite anyone that has a question or comment to go ahead and put that in there as we're wrapping things up. And while we're allowing some time for that, I'd just like to thank Max for this information and everyone for joining us. The second session in this series is next Wednesday at noon. And the topic for that session is employee engagement, how to get buy-in and accountability. So that should prove to be some great information there as well. We do have a question. Can we get a copy of the presentation? Um, I don't know about the presentation in and of itself, but we will be, we recorded this session and we'll be sending that out, Max. Um, I can send a PDF of the presentation if they'd like that. Okay, great. So we'll send that, I'll send that out with the recording. Okay, they said that would be great. Any other questions? So upcoming events. So we have um, an operational excellence workshop that we do, which goes into more detail the topics that we talked about here. And we have one coming up in Dubois through the Northwest IRC on March 8th. And Molly, do you know if we have other ones scheduled? Let me look here, your schedule. We do. Let me just find it. So we yeah, two boys is March 8th. And yeah, the other one, me, Bill, is March 22nd. And those details are on our website, nwirc.org. And those are open session, or we can come in-house and give a um, in-house session for your employees typically up to 20 employees because we have simulations and games and um, the simulations only set up for 20 people, but that's another option. Okay, we have one other question that just came in. Um, it was just a comment. Uh, Neil said, great presentation, thank you. So Thanks Neil for the feedback. 
Yeah, I think with that, we are safe to go ahead and end the presentation for today. Hope to see everybody again on Wednesday, next Wednesday at noon for our second session. So thank you, everyone. I hope you have a great day. Thanks, everyone.